Hello, bonjour, Alberta. Did you know that at least 238,000 people speak Francais in Alberta? And those numbers just keep on growing? Oui, oui, c'est vrai, it's true. And thanks to Shaw TV Community Access Programming, we get to reach out to everyone to let you know all about special people, places, events, and activities happening right here in this great province in both English and en français. That's right, mes amis. We begin the first part of our program in English, and then we repeat it en français. So stay with us. Restez à l'écoute. Hello, bonjour, Alberta. I'm Anne Boiteau. And I'm Marc Lalonde. Welcome to uh, the only bilingual interview talk show of its kind in Canada, produced by Shaw Community Access TV since 2012. Mm -hmm. This year, we're celebrating Canada's 150th anniversary. And one of our guests this year is Michel Bouchard, who is a professor at uh, UNBC and also an anthropologist. Welcome, Michel. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, great to have you. Yes, so uh, we ask of all our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves. So where are you from and what brought you to uh, Alberta and to northern BC? Well, I'm originally from northern Alberta, so I'm in the Peace River country. I always say Fala because that's where I went to school. Okay. But I'm fourth generation because I guess my grandmother, Kamo, I guess her family came up in 1894 in the Riviera Kibal. She eventually went up north, met my grandfather, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> You've been studying it since uh, then, I think, <laughs> yes. So, okay. and uh, you became an anthropologist. So yeah. where did you, did you go to school? Yeah. I ended up going, well, I guess, starting at the University of Toronto, got my bachelor's degree there, University Laval in Quebec City for my master's, when came back to Alberta mm -hmm. in Edmonton, I guess, the U of A for my PhD, oh. and from there, went, worked here and there, and finally ended up getting a tenure track job at the University of Northern British Columbia in 2000. And you teach, what do you teach there? So anthropology, the study of humanity, but my expertise is looking at issues of, of ethnicity and nation and nationalism and comparative. So I look at French speakers in North America, but I also look at what Russian speakers in Estonia and, Russia and minority populations in Russia to try and understand how they define themselves. Okay, and you've been there. Oh yes, all the way up to the Arctic Ocean and back. Ah, oh, so, so what what kind of stories yeah, do you have tell from us Russia? About I'm sure one people of your would trips. be quite interested. Oh, where to start? But I think probably the most exciting trip, in a sense, is when we used to go. Yes, we would start go to the city of Vakuta. This is past the Arctic Circle. So in July, it's 24-hour light, and from there we would get on this all-terrain vehicle, aka our tank, and from there we'd go visit I guess, the reindeer herder. So we would go almost to the Arctic Ocean, meet I guess various families, see how they. Mm -hmm live before coming back, taking the train for 24 hours, come back to 64 hours, and then another 24 to, I guess, to, to Moscow. Wow. That's and why do they why do they herd reindeers? Uh, because reindeer is everything for them. They take the hides to make their clothing, ah. the, the meat for their food. But the reindeer hate hates it when it's warm. Because warm you have also I guess lots of flies and I guess other parasites. So the reindeer want to move north, I guess, to the Arctic Ocean, where it's relatively cool, there's lots of fresh food for them, they eat during the summer, those few months of the summer, and then the winter, it'd be too cold, too much wind, so they come back to the ah. forest where they can dig through the snow and eat almost like lichens, in the sense that they, which is their preferred food, and in the spring, they start all over again. Oh, and these people that you, you went to see, they've been doing this for thousands of years. Oh yes, and they live in what's quite interesting, it's very traditional, so in the sense they use reindeer herders, to, like, reindeer to pull their sleds, the herders in the sense live in chums, it's almost like a teepee-like structure, so they live in this almost year round, and for them that is not only just their, their way of making money, but also it's their way of life, it's, it's their livelihood. So, a lot of parallels with the traditional yeah. First Nations in, in Canada, for example? Oh, yes, yeah, a lot of the same challenge because there are lots of oil, gas, in a sense, and how to, in a sense, to ensure that the environment is maintained so that the reindeer can continue the to eat. Life and life also uh, is. remains uh, the same. Yes. You're also an author. Yes. You've got a book uh, that you have co-written with 
uh, two other people. Mm -hmm. It's called Songs of the Rivers. Songs Upon the Rivers. Upon the Rivers, I'm sorry. It's available uh, on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why Songs Upon the Rivers is because what we want to show is that if you look, the French speakers, and this French speakers would be the French speaking Canadian, Metis, but also the Iroquois, they were crossing the entire continent in the United States and in Canada and singing. Every, every account of every English speaker who talks about the Boyajars always talk about their boat songs. So I guess so the, the imagery, the idea, so for our hundreds of years, these songs would have been echoing through the valleys across the continent. So hence, songs upon the rivers. And, and the okay. rivers is how they got around. That, yes, those were yes, the highways. Yes. Uh, so when you say all over the continent, uh, are, are you talking the USA entire US. continent, east and west? Well, for example, as the Voyageur, like if you take a city such as Saint Louis, Saint Louis, we understand, we know it as Saint Louis, but started off at Saint Louis. There was the majority was founded by French speakers. They were kind of coming up from two directions. You have les Creoles, the Creoles coming up from, I guess, from uh, from Lower Louisiana, I guess, uh, from and then coming up the Mississippi. But you have the other French speakers, the Canadiens, who were in the Great Lakes region, and they're coming up, coming down yeah. from there, and then they kind of meet, I guess, in I guess in Saint Louis, and until the 1830s. Saint Louis, the majority would have been sort of a, it would have been a French speaking city. Wow. Yes. Okay. I guess we see other other cities in the West of the United States mm -hmm. with, with names like Coeur d'Alene oh, yes. and, and, and things like that. And that's for the same reason because of the, because of the fur trade. I guess up until the uh, up until the Oregon Trail in the 1840s, the majority of the non-indigenous population was French speaking, mm -hmm. and they were the workers. I guess of the fur trade. So so the fur trade was as important to the south of the 49th as it was I guess to the I guess, to, to the, the north. north. And that's why we kind of forget this 49th parallel is an artificial kind of line yeah. that was drawn. And it's fairly recent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't all there that before. Sort of thing. So th this would have been before the, 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 the settlers, the European immigrant settlers moved west. And the theme of our book, we see, you know, it's generation after generation. So first, I guess, in the Great Lakes region, one was Detroit. Detroit was majority French speakers, but the settlers come in. And then the French speakers kind of move out, and other settlers come in. And it's almost like this, but the French French speakers are always there first, in a sense. And, they're, and they are there when, I guess, more of the Anglo-Americans arrive. And they kind of are kind of, you know, eventually overwhelmed. But traces remain. That's why you have, I guess, yeah. one of the oldest Catholic churches outside of Quebec is actually just found, I guess, you see it in Detroit. I think it dates, I guess, to the early, I guess, early 1700s. It was rebuilt, of course, but you have, in a sense, of this, a very, if you, if you start scratching, you find this, this long mm -hmm. history. And that's what the goal, we, what we want to do with the book. We have these little bits and pieces here and there, but nobody had tied them together. So rather than simply having a thread here, a thread there, we tried to recreate at least a picture of the full tapestry. Well, wow, it's interesting, eh? That uh, the French were there first. Always. Well, even and not just <laughs> in Canada. No, in, that's in the right. United States also. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and even after the migration of the Acadians to to the, the lower Mississippi, uh, New Orleans area. And I'm sure you saw that little film called The Revenant, The Revenant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what is interesting, the original Revenant, a lot of the words were in French. And there's a one point in a sense where Hugh Glass, in, sense, in, in the description, says, yes, then you have five, I guess, five Canadian boatmen, I guess, took him from one fort to the next. So, and they were using all the ter French terms for, I guess, for buffalo berries, French terms in a sense for the, the Black Hills, where the Côte Noire. So we can see, even in the, this original account, Hugh Glass would certainly have had to learn some French if he were to si survive more than just the grizzly bear. Hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And so how long a project like this did uh, it take for... Well, the first, I guess, our first co-author, Robert uh, Foxker, and I think he has been working on this probably for 20-some 20, 20 years, I guess it was wow. kind of his passion. But then I kind of brought in, in a sense, it's, I guess was put in contact through the publishers. I came in kind of as more with the academic experience, do a lot of the writing, rewriting, integrating primary sources. And then our third, I guess, third author, in a sense, is more a junior scholar. I guess he's now, I guess, an assistant professor at Carleton University, but who himself has background, in a sense, I guess, from, I guess, the Métis, but of the Great Lakes region. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. Can we talk so about the Métis yeah. a little? Because we, we had people from the Métis Association of Alberta on, on our <laughs> show uh, a year or so ago. And uh, to my surprise, Alberta has more Métis than any other part of Canada. <laughs> um, so, of course, Métis, uh, very specifically, are, are these, these European immigrants that married First Nations women <laughs> and developed their own culture <laughs> back then. Um, how, how did that actually work because 
you know, the, 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 the First Nations women were very integrated into their own culture. So, so how did that work? Well, we'll just, we give, for example, an example in our book. There was a certain, I guess, I believe, it was a certain Michel, it was his last name. And they describe, I guess, there's one author, I guess, Ross Cox, an Irishman, who was in, I guess, in, I guess, uh, in, in, the, I guess in the Pacific Northwest, who describes how this particular Monsieur, uh, this particular Michel, courted, I guess, a woman for a long time because she had other suitors within her own community. Michel went to the uncles. He went to, I guess, to the family members. He went to show that he would be a, an active contributor to, I guess, to their community. So I think there's a lot of time and effort and sense put into it. And even things, simple things, for example, we had the cliche of the coureur de bois with the beard, but in reality, they had been clean shaven because that, <laughs> they wanted to be presentable to the women. They wanted to and, show and that they were, And First Nations men didn't have beards. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so they've been clean shaved, could you know, try to dress as nicely as possible, and also would have ingratiated themselves to the kin network. So, so it was more than just kind of a, a liaison. It was very much kind of finding, I guess, a spouse, a wife, in a sense, fact, and then by extension, getting family, I guess, and being part of that family. So it did take a lot of time and effort. Yes, oh yes. And not that many French women around. The men came first, right? So. Oh yes, there was big, big imbalance. Yeah. Les, les filles du roi beginning. came to Quebec uh, way back uh, in, in the, the, the days of Nouvelle France, but that didn't happen in the West, did it? Yeah. But I think what our book, in a sense, what we're doing, what our argument, in a sense, perhaps is somewhat perhaps heretical, is we're saying that the, this message, this this mates, the kind of this Métis community, wasn't just the Red River. It was continental. It was kind it was of everywhere. It was everywhere. Uh -huh. And you see, like, for example, there's Alexis de Tocqueville. At one point, I guess, he's waiting for his guide, and he says, oh, this man comes to me. He looks like an Indian. He's fully dressed. All of a sudden, he comes to me, taps me on my shoulder, and tells, you know, tells, uh, says to me in a French, I guess, in a Fr in perfect French with a Norman accent, yeah, put your bags here, but be careful not to drown. Many fall in. And you ask him, so how's it that you speak French? He says, well, my father is Canadien. <laughs> my mother was First Nations, and thus, I'm a beau brûlé. So in other words, he uh -huh. said, he was kind of Métis. Oh. And that's what they called it back then. Yeah, so you have these different terms. And Bois Brûlé, we found it, I guess, in the, we found it in the Great Lakes region. We find it okay. in the Pacific Northwest. So it seems, I think, so what we're arguing, it wasn't just the Red River, it was a continental network of people who were interrelated, intermarried, who were, were traveling thousands of, of miles over the years. And this identity seems to have emerged and taken shape and was spread over the entire region, not just a small locale. And was it uh, different tribes as well who did that, or more particular oh, to well, certain yeah, ones? In the case specific, we talk about, for example, uh, Ma, I guess a certain Marie Dorion. Well, what is interesting, the Dorion men, they were kind of the grandfather had married, I guess, a woman from one First Nations on the other side, I guess, of the Rocky Mountains. The, the father had married a First Nations woman from another, I guess, an, another nation. Oh, and wow. finally, the grandson married, finally, I guess, a woman from, I guess, from a, a on, third. A third, yes. And, and what we see is that, but the one thing that they maintained through these entire generations was the French language and this, this identity. So it's kind of, so it wasn't just, it was kind of a, yeah. and again. And that even, was the common thread. Yes. Michel, it's all the time we have. Thank you so much for being with us and telling us about these very interesting uh, people. And about your book, Songs yes. Upon the Rivers. And My for book. all of you out there, thank you for joining us. And please stay tuned, on continue en français. Thank you.